بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد so tonight insha'Allah we're going to discuss the defects that that prevent an animal from being legible or eligible to be slaughtered at Udhiyah. So if an animal, one of these def defects or more obviously are found in the animal, then this animal cannot be slaughtered. Or this animal, if slaughtered, the fulfillment of Udhiyah will not be there. So Udhiyah will not be fulfilled. Essentially, we want to look for an animal that is free of these defects. So you want to look for an animal as perfect as possible, as perfect as possible to present to Allah, to present as your sacrifice to Allah. You want to look for the best animal as possible free of defects and the best animal according to what we mentioned in in previous lessons so when it comes to the defects in an animal generally the principle for the defects in an animal the principle for the defects in an animal are those defects that affect the meat of the animal those defects those uh, defects that affect the quality of the meat of the animal that's what we're looking at so the meat of the animal all those things that are not deemed meat but are eaten so they, for example, they might say uh, like, like an ear, for example, but we're going to discuss that better just now. So, the, so it's not called meat, but it's also something that's eaten at times by certain people. So basically, those parts, the, these defects affect the animal, the meat of the animal, or those things that are an objective and those things that are eaten by, by a person in, within the animal. Another thing that it would be, sometimes the defects would rotate around things that affect the outside appearance of the animal. So sometimes it because a defect on the outside indicates that it might have some defect on the inside. And other times it's because it just, it just makes the appearance, it just affects the appearance. So it's not the best kind of appearance for the animal to slaughter, to put forward to Allah. So basically it just gives the animal an appearance that is not it's not apt to slaughter with so that's why this defect would not would not uh, would make the animal would not fulfill the the udhiya if you slaughtered with this animal so the first de uh, defect they speak about is al al awra so they say this is the animal rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said al awra al bayyin awar 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 so that means that it's the animal the hamali madhab say it's basically the animal that the eye has basically come out of its socket either out completely or it's basically popped out of its socket so that would be an animal if the eye is like that that you cannot slaughter with that you cannot slaughter with so that means that one or both eyes out of the socket you cannot slaughter you cannot slaughter the animal and they say that this eye is an organ that is an objective an objective so if it's out of the socket or out then it's not going to be you can't really eat this you can't really eat it either because it can't it's not now a good quality to eat it's basically this destroyed basically it's not there and it's like it's not there anymore or it's completely out it's completely out then it's not there then you lose this whole part of the body this whole body part that's objective to eat then then it's out so you're looking for an animal that's eyes are eyes are in place and normal that's number one number two what if the animal is blind so now here if the animal is blind in both eyes because the a hadith there's a, the other hadith that speak about the defects in, in an animal it mentions a few things like four things and a couple of other ahadith indicate to it. But so these ahadith indicate to things like the, the, the eye being there, or but it's out of its socket. So now, if that's a defect, then those that are higher or worse in defect, the, the hadith includes it. Why? They call it in usul tambi. So it indicates to one thing, but indicate but because that thing is indicated, that which is higher than it is also included. It's also included. A way to give an example. Even though this one can be looked at in usul or fiqh of how to analyze the words in a different manner. For example, if Allah says, don't say to your parents, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا uf. Don't say the uf to your parents. So if uf is used, then by using that term, anything worse than uf, yelling, scolding, hitting, for example, no doubt is definitely, is definitely included in this verse. But the, the fact that the verse says uf doesn't mean only uf. But it also includes those that are of a higher level. So the same thing here. So if an animal is blind in both its eyes, then it cannot be slaughtered. It cannot be slaughtered. Now, an animal that is blind in one eye, an animal that is blind in one eye, the Hanbali Madhab say you can slaughter this animal. The Hanbali Madhab say you can slaughter this animal. And they also say if one of the eyes or, or the eyes have whiteness in it, so the eyes in white. But 
but you can uh, but you can see that the, uh, the animal can see still then you can slaughter with this animal and even if the whiteness is covered the entire eye or eye in entire eye that you, you can't see with this eye you can't see with the eye then in that case there's two opinions with many of the fuqaha Burhanuddin ibn Muflih saying that the strong opinion is that you can still slaughter with animal you can still slaughter with animal of course the whiteness would be uh, in one eye the whiteness that takes out sight can be in one eye if it's both eyes then it's taking like a blind animal like a blind animal and if there's whiteness in both eyes that does not affect the sight of the animal then you can slaughter this animal and other other ulama deduce or say most of the other ulama say the meaning of this awra is an animal that basically is one-eyed animal or they say an animal that is blind in one eye so this one you can't slaughter you can't slaughter and you said the have blind in one eye you can slaughter and they also say or blindness of a portion of the eye, or a portion of blindness. So they say like the Hanafi Fuqaha, a third blindness of one third plus, you cannot slaughter, you cannot slaughter. So basically, they say we have, why do we say this? They say one is the Hadith, one is the Hadith. Number two, the fact that our eye is out of the socket or popped out or completely out or his whiteness in it when it cannot count, then this affects the outward appearance of the animal. It affects the outward appearance of the animal, leaving you with not the most good, best looking animal to slaughter for Allah. That's number two. Number three, also it affects what? It affects the animal when it goes out to graze. Because if it cannot see for a blind animal, then it, what, what is it going to graze and eat? What is it going to graze and eat? Or from one eye, it will eat, it will see half of the tree or half of the part that is eating of the fodder or whatever it may be. And it won't see the other, the, the, the other fodder or the other part of the tree or branch on the other side because it can only see from one eye. You can only see from one eye. Therefore, it won't eat as much as the other animals. Therefore, it will eat less and that might have an effect on the inside of the animal, therefore affecting the meat of the animal. So therefore, the animal that has an effect in its eye, an animal that has an effect in its eye, one should try and not slaughter this animal. Ali radiallahu anhu says, Rasul amrana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an nistashrif al-ayn wal uduna that we should look. So that means utlubu salamatahuma. Rasulullah said that when you're looking for an animal to slaughter, try and get that animal that's eye has no blemishes, the eye has no blemishes and defects and so too with the ears. So normal, good eyes, normal, good ears. Now, based on us saying this, a person should try and find an animal, cow, camel, goat or sheep that has normal eyes. If he does not find or he can only afford an animal that has a defect in the eye, so now, again, we're going to work through the, gen the normal principles we've mentioned when there's a difference of opinion. So now when there's a difference of opinion, when there's scope to do something, and a person cannot do that which would take him out of the difference of opinion, but because there's a difference of opinion, it would allow him to still fulfill the action, then in that case, we'd say it's okay. In that case, we'd say it's okay. So for example, an animal that's blind in one eye, an animal that is blind in one eye, or blindness in the eye, so now we said the eye out of the socket or popped out will not count according to them all of the ulama basically. As good as that. But now blindness in one eye, the Hanbali Madhab would allow, the others would not. Blindness to an extent, Hanbali would allow, others would not. So in that case, every time you can get a better eye, a normal eye, you slaughter it. If you, if you do not get that or the animal you can afford has blindness in one eye, the others might say that it's one eyed or blind in one eye, it would not count. But you can only afford this. Do you now not do the Udhiya based on this? And therefore lose out or because the scope for slaughtering this animal based on what relied upon fuqaha i've mentioned do you follow that you can follow that so you can follow you can follow that and therefore you can still slaughter the animal so therefore when 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 you can get out of the difference of opinion do so and when you cannot for some other reason and if you were to not do something because of the difference of opinion something valid something invalid you'd end up not doing the action in a case like this where the action is so recommended in this case, the fact there's a difference of opinion opens the door, opens the door for ease in the religion and you can still do it. That's why Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahmatullahi alayhi, he said that it would not have pleased me if the, if the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not differ in any matter. If they did, the, the fact that they differed in matters of fiqh and matters of religion indicates that people have some elements of ease in the religion. That people have elements of ease in the religion. That's why a man wrote a book and he, of fiqh and he titled the book a book of the difference of opinion of the fuqaha and he showed this book to imam ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi and imam ahmed looked at the book read the book a bit and then he said change the name of the book and say 
Name it the book that indicates that people have ease. People have ease in their deen. Because the fact there's a difference of opinion shows that there's a, uh, they could be this way or that way. If it is only one way, people would, anyone who misses that mark, he'd be wrong. Anyone who misses that mark would be wrong. So that is, again, a benefit of, of a difference of opinion. At times, knowing the difference of opinion can be a negative thing to, to a person. So a person who would look for, look for easy, look for the uh, concessions or he'd look for easy opinions in those masail, that person to know the difference of opinion would be a negative thing for him. That's why some of the ulama, some of the ulama say when a mufti gives fatwa, he should not mention the difference of opinion. Why? Because sometimes people will take that and use it to their advantage and then follow those concessions and those easy opinions only. So the difference of opinion itself is a technical mas'ala and we've pointed out a couple of things to it, but inshallah in the future, when we discuss matters of um, ijtihad and taqlid and those things in usul al-fiqh, then inshallah we'll mention it more. So that's with regards to, that's with regards to an animal that we said is awra al-bayyin awruha. Then the next thing they mention, they say wal al-ajfa al-hazila allati la mukha fiha. So the next defect they mention is an animal that is so lean, it's lean and lean to the extent that the bone, there's no real marrow in the bone. So it's not just lean. Al-ajfa allati la tunki. That's what the hadith is. Al-ajfa allati la tunki. So it's this lean animal, but not just leanness to the extent that the bone has no kind of marrow inside. So a bone, when it doesn't have marrow inside, it basically has redness inside. So the animal is so lean that the bone does not even have marrow inside. So it has a kind of redness inside. It has a kind of redness inside. This animal, this animal you cannot slaughter. This animal you cannot slaughter. So in saying that, some farmers mentioned that if spring comes quickly, if spring comes quickly and the animals now have, now have more grass and stuff to graze on, then they could go and graze and then they'd eat and they'd fatten up. They'd fatten up. It would not be this lean animal anymore. But because this happens now, the spring comes in. They eat and they fatten up quickly. They now fatten up, but to the but not to the extent. No time has gone enough that the bone starts developing marrow inside. So can you slaughter this animal? Can you slaughter this animal? The ulama say you can slaughter this animal. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said al ajfa al la tunti. So two things. One, it has to be lean, and two, it has to not have the marrow inside the bone. Allati la mukha fiha. So the one that is not lean, but doesn't have marrow in the bone, you can slaughter that animal. And that animal, which is lean, but has marrow in the bone, you can slaughter this animal. You can slaughter this animal. So that's the second defect that would make the udhiyah invalid. So then the third defect, the third defect, they say, arja. So they say this is the third one. It's a lame animal. It is a lame animal. This animal is so lame that it cannot walk with the other healthy, normal animals to where they graze in their feet. So this animal is too lame and weak to walk with them. It's too lame and weak to walk with them. So as you can see, if it cannot feed, then it's going to lose its health and therefore it affects the meat again. It affects the meat again. So that's number three, a lame animal. And number four, they say al-hatma. They say it's an animal that, an animal that's lost its molar teeth. An animal that's lost its molar teeth. Or other ulama describe this as an animal that's lost most of its teeth. An animal that's lost most of its teeth. So here, most of the teeth, generally, in the Hanbali Madhab, especially in this chapter, they'd say, they'd say more than half. When it comes to not half and less, but more than half, you cannot slaughter with this animal or it will be makruh, as we discussed. So their principle would be more than half. So half and less would be okay. Their half and less would be okay compared to, for example, the Hanafi Madhab. They give leeway of until a third. So a third and more in certain things like the tail or the ear, even the tongue, as we mentioned, then that would not count. So basically, if you lose teeth, if you lose, if the animal has no teeth, more than half the teeth are gone, you cannot slaughter with it, with it. or the molars are gone, or the molars, which means it affects the animal to chew. It affects the animal to chew the food. And also, it would affect the animal from basically biting, biting their grass or the fodder to take in, and then also to bite to chew. So that's why in the, in the Hanafi Madhab, they mention that the loss, the, to lose teeth or not have teeth, they say for a sheep. They say for a sheep. 
And they say for a tongue, they say to not to have a cut tongue. So again, cut means a third plus would not count. But they say this for this for a cow, this for a cow, because they use their tongue more for their for feeding. They use a tongue more to grab the food that they eat compared to a sheep using its teeth. But now Ibn Abidin, some of the I think Ibn Abidin or Al Kasani, one of the I think Ibn Abidin, he mentions that according to the principles of the madhab, even a sheep, if a sheep were to lose a third or more of the tongue, then you can't slaughter it. Then you can't slaughter it. So here is the teeth losing the molar teeth or losing more than a third, uh, more than half the teeth. Or in the Hanafi madhab, more than a third, a third and more. And then for the tongue as well, for the tongue as well, that would be another defect. If the animal lost, if the animal, whether it's any of the animals, any of the animals, whether it's lost more than half of its tongue in the Hanbali madhab or a third and more of its tongue in the Hanafi madhab, this animal, this animal you cannot slaughter. Now, we mentioned the animal with eyesight. There's one more thing that has to do with the eyesight is an animal that can only see in the day. The animal can only see in the day. So at night, at night the animal is blind. At night the animal is blind. Can you slaughter this animal? The ulama say yes. The ulama say you can. Why? Because the main time for grazing and feeding for an animal is, is the day. So at night, the fact that the animal can't see, it won't really affect. Or it won't really affect. And then they say another defect is an animal that has a broken limb. An animal that has a broken limb, you can't slaughter this animal. Of course, having a broken limb would once again affect the animal from walking to go out and to go out and feed. That would again have an internal effect on the meat. It would have an internal effect on the meat. And then the next defect they mentioned, they mention an animal that udders have become dry. The udders have become dry. And this animal that does not produce milk anymore, this animal cannot, you cannot slaughter with it. You cannot slaughter with it. Then the next animal they mention that you cannot slaughter, they say, this is the Hanafi Fuqaha mentioned, they say Al-Jallala, Al-Jallala. So Jallala is generally the term the Fuqaha use for an animal that feeds off impurity. An animal that feeds off impurity. So what the Hanafi Fuqaha say here is the animal that's feed is only impurity. It's only impurity, nothing else. This animal you cannot slaughter. So generally, when they speak in the chapter of food for about the, the ruling of Jallala, eating the Jallala. Now this we are talking Udhiyah, that means the reward of slaughtering Udhiyah. It doesn't apply to just slaughtering a normal animal because the rules would differ. Udhiyah itself is an ibadah and at other times slaughtering an animal is not an ibadah itself. So here for Jallala, this is an animal that's fed with impurity. So generally they differ. The fuqaha would differ with the rule of eating this animal, the rule of eating this animal that is fed with impurity between being makruh and between being haram, hamili madhab haram. So they say basically this jallala, you need to have a period of time go by where it's fed only pure things. A period of time has to go by when it's only fed pure things so that its meat and its growth and it's whatever's inside of it, the milk and eggs, it basically can then be re-stimulated to something pure and be regrow something pure. So they mention a certain amount of days that the animal must, must be kept away, fed with only pure things, and then it can be slaughtered. So that would be normal times outside Udhiyah, then this meat that comes from this animal or this egg that comes from this animal or this milk that comes from this animal would now be deemed pure. And before that, it would be either makroom to eat from this animal or it would be haram, in the but we will touch on that mas'ala when we speak on it in food. So now this jallada to slaughter this animal, the Hanafi madhab say it will not count, it will not count. So what needs to happen? Uh, number one, we said it's only fed with, it's only fed with impurity. Therefore, if something, if it's fed something else with the impurity, something else with the impurity, it would not be jallala. Or it could be jallala in some senses, but in terms of sufficing for udhiya, in terms of sufficing for udhiya, it would count. It would count if it's fed something else. If it's only fed impurity, then it has to be kept away from being fed impurity, but for a certain amount of days. So the Hanafi Fuqaha say here that a camel has to be kept aside and if only fed hala, uh, pure food for 40 days, and a cow or ox or buffalo um, for 20 days, and a sheep for 10 days. And thereafter, they would deem the meat basically having purified itself kind of if we were to phrase it like that and then you can slaughter this animal and then you can slaughter this animal so before that before it goes through that cleansing process 
If it is only fed impurity, you cannot slaughter this animal. So this one here, the Hanafi Fuqaha mentioned it. Another animal that you can not slaughter is an animal that the horns, the cover of the horn basically is broken. It has a crack on it. So now we're not speaking of the horn itself, but the outer layer of the horn. The outer layer of the horn. The next animal that you can't slaughter is an animal that is that is sick, an animal that is ill. So they say for this animal, either you'd know the sickness because it's apparent on the animal. You can see clearly that, if the, that the animal is not well. You can see it is sick. You can see it is sick. And the other way of knowing the illness is you can see the effects of an illness on the animal. So you can detect that what? The animal, for example, is not eating as normal. You can see it's not eating. It doesn't feel like eating. You can tell that this animal is sick. Or you can tell that this animal is lethargic or gets tired quickly. This animal you cannot eat. This animal you cannot eat. Because it would, uh, you cannot slaughter, because it would indicate it is ill. It would indicate it is ill. So this animal that is ill, the fuqaha say it's not merely illness, but it's illness that would actually affect the meat. So it's illness that would actually affect the meat. If it's an illness that does not affect the meat, then, then it would count to slaughter. And number two, it must be an apparent illness. It must be an apparent illness, which means that the illness basically affects the animal. You can see it from the outside, which means if you slaughter the animal and it's there, and then when you slaughter the animal, then let's say somebody comes, a vet or whoever, to check the meat, to check if it's, if it would, if it's, uh, if it's to a level that people can consume it. It's healthy enough to be consumed by people. There's nothing in it that would affect people who eat this. So if it, that person detected, this inspector detected, this meat is not actually on a level that people could eat. It would actually cause someone to be sick to eat it. And therefore, this animal cannot be eaten. Then would, can you slaughter this animal? Or would this animal account for all the hayah? Does the person have to slaughter again? You'd say this animal can count because the illness that affects is an apparent illness that you can see that affects out. You can see it from the outer side of the animal. Number one and number two, it is an illness that affects the meat. So that's so an illness detected after the animal is slaughtered would not affect the validity of the slaughter. Connected to that, they say, is an animal that is pregnant. An animal that is pregnant will be permissible to slaughter. An animal that is pregnant will be permissible to slaughter, according to most of the ulama, except the Shafi'i Madhab. So the Shafi'i Madhab say an animal that is pregnant, you cannot slaughter. An animal that is on the brink or giving birth, you cannot slaughter. And an animal that is suckling, that is suckling, breastfeeding, you cannot, you cannot slaughter. You slaughter, you cannot slaughter. So in the Hanafi Madhab, they say if the animal is close to giving birth, the animal is close to giving birth, then it's makruh to slaughter this animal. But it would be permissible, it would be valid, it would be valid. So now in saying that, if the animal, if we say that pregnancy is not a defect that would affect the validity of udhiyah, then let's say the animal that you've, you've specified now for udhiyah goes into labor. So would that be a sickness that would prevent the validity of the udhiyah? So the ulama say that if the animal is gone into labor, it would not affect the validity of the udhiyah. They say because that's a normal thing. But if it so happened, if it so happened that this sheep, when she's in labor, in this situation of hers, her labor is a bit dangerous. She could die from this labor. It's not a normal labor. There's some complication in the labor. This animal, in this situation, you cannot slaughter this animal. This animal, in this situation, you cannot slaughter this, this sheep or cow or which, whichever animal that you are slaughtering. Number two, sometimes an animal or sheep eats something. And it has an effect on the stomach. So the animal bloats. The animal bloats. And certain situations when the animal bloats, then it's, it's dangerous for the life of the animal. It's dangerous for the life of the animal. The animal's bowels need to be evacuated. If not, the animal can die. If not, the animal can die. So the animal in this situation, an animal in this situation will take the rule of a sick animal and therefore you can't slaughter. Therefore you can't slaughter until it's normalized and its bowels are evacuated and it's normal again. Another situation is an animal that is unconscious. An animal that is unconscious, this animal takes the ruling of a sick animal and you cannot slaughter this animal. You know, it would not count for old here. Other animals that also, let's say it had fallen down, so now it's kind of crippled. Okay, we mentioned if a limb is broken, you cannot slaughter it. But this animal was knocked down by another animal. So now it's quite, it's injured basically, something like that, injured or it fell from a place and it's now injured. In that state, while it is like that, in the state while it is like that, then that animal, that animal you cannot slaughter. That animal you cannot slaughter. Now with all the defects that we're mentioning, with all the defects that we're mentioning, 
while the defect is present in the animal, you cannot slaughter it. So if the animal, for example, had and is sick, so you can't slaughter it. But then it got cured before Udhiyah, before the day you or the moment you are slaughtering on the days of Eid, it's now cured, then that animal now you can slaughter it again. So as long as the ailment is there, you can't slaughter. But the moment the ailment goes and becomes normal again, the animal, then you can slaughter it. Then you can slaughter it. So now connected to that, the Shafi'i Fuqaha mentioned another defect, and that is one of the haunches of the animal or the meat bearing body parts of the animal. If a small piece of the of that body part is injured or like torn off, it won't affect because they say that you don't really detect. But if a big piece of that body part, the haunch or that meat bearing body part is out, then in that case, in that case, you can't slaughter that animal. You can't slaughter that animal. The next one they mention is an animal that has um, more than half of the of the ear or the horn cut off or broken off. More than half of the ear cut off or broken off. So in that case, an animal that is more than half of its horn or its ear cut or broken off, you cannot slaughter that animal. But now, the second opinion in the Hanbali Madhab, opinion of many Hanbali Fuqaha, like Ibn, Ibn Muflih and Mardawi and a few others, they say that you can slaughter this animal. They say you can slaughter this animal because the hadith that mentions this, they say it's a weak hadith. In the chain, there's a man named uh, Ibn Kulayb. They say he's unknown, he's majhul. So therefore, this narration of having proper ears or horns, they say it's not authentic and therefore you can slaughter the animal, number one. Number two, they say that, they say that generally, generally the horn and the ear are not body parts that are eaten or they're not objective body parts. There's no real worth to these body parts. So if the ear was to be eaten, if the ear was by certain people that they eat the ear, then this opinion cannot work. This opinion cannot work. You go with the general opinion of the other fuqaha, majority of them across the schools, had a defect in the ear, then you can't eat. But generally, if the ear or the horns are not really worth much and they're not really eaten, then this is a strong opinion, especially with the hadith being, the hadith being, uh, uh, the hadith not being authentic, especially with the hadith not being authentic. That's why the uh, Shafi'i fuqaha, they say that if an animal has broken horns or no horns, it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect. They say generally, the horns are not something eaten. The horns are not something eaten. So that again ties into what we mentioned with the Hamali fuqaha. And then, but the Shafi'i scholars say that the ear, they say if there's, the, there's a paralysis in the ear, to the extent where now this ear becomes something you cannot eat, now it becomes something you cannot eat, then in this case, this animal would not be valid to slaughter with. The animal would not be valid to slaughter with. So that's basically most of the, def uh, the defects that the Fuqaha mentioned. Um, most of them are Hanbali and others from other schools that they mentioned. And a, a person should try and get the best animal that he can slaughter, free from all defects as best as he can. And then, if an animal is not a normal, healthy, normal, without any defect animal, then the defects that would affect the validity are these we mentioned. And other defects would not affect. Other defects would not affect the animal. So now they mention defects in an animal that do not make the udhiya invalid. So if the animal has one of these following things that we're going to mention, then this animal, this animal would be valid to slaughter. This animal would be valid to slaughter. So they say, first of all, they say al betara So this is an animal that doesn't have a tail. So this is according to the Hanbali method. This animal does not have a tail. But now this mas'ala of the tail, it connects to, it connects to defects of in an animal that prevent the udhiyah. So now here the Hanbali madhab differentiate between the tail in a sheep and the tail in a goat and cow and camel. So the cattle and Camel and goat, their tail is one category in the Hanbali Madhab and the tail of a sheep is another category in the Hanbali Madhab. The other fuqaha do not make a differentiation. The other fuqaha do not make a differentiation. So the other fuqaha would say for a tail in general on any of these animals, goat, sheep or cattle or camel, then they'd say if there's no tail, the animal cannot be slaughtered. The animal cannot be slaughtered. Or they say like the Hanafi and Maliki fuqaha, they say, a third or more. So the uh, Hamadiki Fuqaha, I think they say more than a third. More than a third. And the Hanafi Fuqaha, a third and more of their being of the tail not being there cut off or broken off of the tail, it will not be valid. The same with and the Hanafi Fuqaha, like the ear as well. So in the Shafi'i Madhab, any portion of the tail broken off, it would not make it valid to slaughter. 
do not make it valid to slaughter. So now we have the Shafi'i Fuqaha, Hanafi Fuqaha, and Maliki Fuqaha saying that about the tail. In the Hamali Madhab, they differentiate, as we said, between the tail of a sheep and the tail of the other animals that you can slaughter. So they say the tail of the sheep, which they call it Alia or Ilya. So this tail of a sheep, they say if the animal has less than less than half of the tail so they say less than half of the tail let's let's phrase it again they say that this sheep that has more than half of the tail cut off more than half of the tail cut off or broken off this sheep cannot be slaughtered so that means half and more of the tail there present you can slaughter you can slaughter this is for this is for sheep this is for sheep and for the other animals they say whether the tail is cut off or the animal is born without a tail. They call it batra. This animal would be valid. This animal would be valid to slaughter. This animal would be valid to slaughter. So again, in this mas'ala, we have the difference of opinion. We have the difference of opinion. So if a person only has animals that have no tail, or cut off tails, or cut off severely tails, that's the only thing he has, then the difference of opinion would show their scope again. The Hanbali might have allowing it, but they allow it in the tail of none other than the sheep, other than the sheep. Because they say the tail in a sheep is is, a, is something worth, is something that is that is worthy, is something that has worth. So therefore, in a sheep, the tail should be there. And in the other animals, they say it's not really, it doesn't really have worth. That's why they say it doesn't matter if it has a tail or not. It doesn't matter if it has a tail or not. So sometimes some farmers could say, but sometimes we cut off the tails of an animal, of an animal, of the sheep. Of the sheep because there's sometimes a benefit in the animal in that because if the tail is there then the animal would grow wool and fat and it would come if there's a tail it would basically grow over the tail side of the animal therefore making it quite heavy on the animal and the animal will find difficulty and tiredness as it walks but if we cut off the tail if we cut off the tail then then the sheep would then the wool or the fat would go onto the back of the sheep therefore the sheep can move normally again so there's a benefit in cutting the tail of the sheep so here the general trend of the fuqaha is that this will still not count this would still not count because they say for a tail according to the majority of the ulama no tail would not be valid and according to the hanbali fuqaha if it's from a sheep then it would not be valid and if it's from other than a sheep, then it would be valid. Then it would be valid. So now, in saying this, you get some types of sheep that do not have a normal sheep tail. Like uh, you get an Australian sheep. I think it's Australian white sheep. So this sheep, it has a tail that looks like a tail of a cow. It looks like a tail of a cow. So this is a sheep that does not have a tail, a ilia or alia, that they speak about the fuqa. So what would the ruling be on slaughtering the sheep? The ruling would be the fuqaha who touch on this mas'ala. They say this animals, the tail of this animal, or these animals that do not have, and these sheep that do not have an ilia or an alia, the sheep tail. These ones generally have like a tail like a cow. Then these, the tail here is not, it doesn't have worth. So it would basically resemble the rule the fuqaha give for the, for the cow, the tail of the cow and the tail of the goat. Where? It doesn't have worth. So therefore, this animal is born without an actual tail. Oh, it's born with a tail that's not, it doesn't have worth. So therefore, it would be permissible to slaughter this animal. It would be permissible to slaughter this animal. So it's not a, it doesn't resemble an animal that has a cut off or broken off ilia. It doesn't resemble that. Because this animal does not have in the first place the sheep tail. It doesn't have the first place the sheep tail. Therefore, the rules of tail, the rules of the tail that would apply to this animal is the rule that you'd apply to the tail of the animals that have similar tails, which is the which is cattle or cows. So that's what they say about that. And sometimes a person could say that in the place we are in, the place we are in, there's only animals or the sheep that, that's, that are there, they all have the tails cut off. All of them have the tails cut off. So now here, according to all the ulama, all the ulama, you can't slaughter this animal. Because now sheep tail also is cut. So the Hamali Madhab also, the scope of the Hamali Madhab goes out. So here, those ulama who given fatwa on this that I've seen, they say in this case, you should try tell the people to try and slaughter an animal other than a sheep, if possible. Because a, a, like seven can chain a cow, seven can chain a camel if they're available. If a goat is available, try to slaughter a goat. But now if there's no other option, if there's no other option, then the option is either we slaughter this animal that has a defect, that in theory the Ubhiya would not be valid with, or we do not perform the, the 
ibadah of udhiyah, or we do not perform the ibadah of udhiyah. So here, those ulama have touched on this. They say in this case, performing this symbol of Allah, this apparent open symbol of Allah of slaughtering, takes preference over an animal with such a defect. And they use the principle that we mentioned before, we mentioned before, al maysur la yisqutu bil ma'sur. That that thing which you're able to do will not fall because of something else that you're not able to do. So you're not able to slaughter a normal animal because of this one defect. But the, the rest of the animal is fine and normal. So they say in this case, you, you slaughter that animal, especially since many times farmers who all do this, it would be for some benefit in the animal. It would be for some benefit for the animal, let's say it like that rather. So in that case, they would say you still perform the old here and then you slaughter this animal, you slaughter this animal that you have available in front of you. The same thing would apply to animals with other defects. If you have animals in front of you, all of them, there's something wrong with the eye, for example. Something is wrong with the eye, for example, anything. And there any of the defects. So it's either you slaughter that animal or no udhiyah. Because you don't you only have this animal in front of you, there's no other options, there's no other groups, then in that case you slaughter that animal. In that case, you slaughter that animal. Then another animal that is valid to slaughter is an animal that is born with small ears. So it doesn't have normal ears, but the ears are small. They say it's permissible to slaughter this animal. Even an animal that has born without horns. So this animal is born without horns, you can slaughter this animal, there's no problem. Another one that they say, that they say is, if an animal is affected with diarrhea, a, a diarrhea, if an animal is affected with diarrhea, su'al, then this animal, the Hanafi fuqaha touch on it, they say you can slaughter this animal. They say you can slaughter this animal. They say even if an animal is too old to give birth, so it's that old, she can't now have children, she can't now conceive, then this animal, you can still slaughter it. You can still slaughter it. And another thing that they mention, Another thing that they mention is that if an animal is brought in to get slaughtered, so now it's brought near now where you're going to slaughter it, or there where you are going to slaughter it, or during the slaughter process, the slaughtering process, the animal were to get injured. The animal were to get injured, an injury to the extent that as we an, a, an injury that we mentioned earlier that would make the udhiya invalid. Like for example, let's say you got the animal there and the knife basically goes into the eye of the animal, therefore blinding the animal. Or, they, or the eye of the animal comes out. Or it were to break its leg as you're just putting it down. That we said, an animal that has broken limb, you can't slaughter it. But in this case, they say it would be valid because now it's happening at the time of slaughtering. Therefore, we'd say, as we'd mentioned in one of the upcoming lectures about the etiquette of slaughtering, that when you bring the animal to the place of slaughtering, bring it with, be gentle, be gentle. Don't harm or hurt the animal. Because there you might then make the, and it's a bit far from the place where you're slaughtering, then you break the animal's leg. This animal then does not become valid for Udhiya. In, in rea reality, that person who pulled the animal roughly, he is going to be responsible for replacing that animal. We'll discuss it later when we speak about the animal getting injured. And if it was because of somebody's fault or no one's fault, what would happen there? So basically, the point is to be gentle. Be gentle with the animal. But then when it's there, almost or tr being trying to put down to slaughter or in the slaughtering process, if it were then to be injured, an injury that would prevent it from being valid, had this injury been there beforehand, then in this case the Udhiya will be valid. The Udhiya will be valid. Now there's a few things that they mention, a few things that they mention that they say the animal would be valid to slaughter, but it would be makru if it has one of these three, four things that it has. So they say, they say if in the ear or the horn of the animal, in the ear or the horn of the animal, there's basically like it's pierced or it's torn. It's pierced or it's torn. In that case, it would be valid. In that case, it would be valid, but it would be makru. Therefore, if somebody were to, let, let's say, as you're going to mention in later lectures, to, uh, in the later uh, upcoming le lectures, to basically specify which animal is for who, try and not pierce the ear of the animal. Try and not pierce the ear of the animal, but let's put a tag or something, putting it on the ear but, or somewhere else on the body, but not to pierce the ear. Because that would be valid, the old hair, but it would be, it would be makruh because the ear should not have a piercing. As we said, Rasulullah said, try and get an animal that's eyes and ears are perfect. Eyes and ears are perfect. And if there's a cut in the ear or the horn until half, that means including half, it would be valid, but it would be makru. It would be valid and it would be makru. Then there's two masail left. So now the next masail that they speak about is slaughtering a castrated animal. Slaughtering a castrated animal. So this animal is castrated. Can you slaughter this animal? They say yes. They say yes. 
because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam dhaha bi kabshain mawjuin Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam slaughtered two rams and they were basically castrated they were basically castrated and the ulama say why they say that castration why it has an effect on the animal the animal now no more can reproduce it can't reproduce anymore so wouldn't that be a defect that uh, prohibits slaughtering this animal on one hand you could say yes because it basically weakens the animal now the animal cannot reproduce anymore but they say when you castrate an animal when you castrate an animal then this has a, a, a positive effect on the meat of the animal the meat becomes more tender therefore slaughtering this animal slaughtering this animal would be permissible slaughtering this animal would be permissible in fact some of the ulama they say you should slaughter an animal that rasulullah slaughtered and he slaughtered an animal as we said that was horned he's a male ram that was horned and that was basically uh, castrated so therefore connected to this uh, the ulama say that if this this castration should happen but not why by uh, the castration should not include cutting the reproductive or organs so it must just be the testicles it must just be the testicles but if the penis of the male is cut as well then this would not count so both together both together therefore if the animal's penis alone were to be cut if that were to happen in the al Labadi, he mentions this he says that they don't that in the way they phrase it that would in, indicate that if the animal's penis was cut alone his male reproductive organ alone was cut then in this case the old hair would be valid so that means the testicles are there, the testicles are there, but the reproductive organ is cut, that would be valid. And therefore, if an animal has one testicle, one testicle, then it would be valid to slaughter. Because if both are cut, then the animal will be valid. So one cut, that means one remains, it would be for sure valid to slaughter with. But the penis alone, penis alone would be valid as well. But penis and testicles, then it would be invalid to slaughter. Then it would be invalid to slaughter. In, in saying this, our second last mas'ala, our second last mas'ala, or third last, is the ruling on castrating animals. What's the ruling on castrating animals? Or a person gets his animal for udhiyah, or he's a farmer. He says, can I castrate my animals for the benefit that's in there for me from the animals? As in, they will, their meat will become better. The meat will become better. So there's a benefit in for you in castrating the animals. The ulama differ on this mas'ala. In general, we can say if there's a benefit for the animal or a benefit for the person, then it would be valid. Then it would be valid. Even though the fuqaha, when we go precisely mentioning that, for example, the Maliki Madhab say you can you can castrate the animals that are that you can eat. You can castrate al ma'kul those animals that you can eat. The Shafi'i Madhab say the same, but they also say this. They also say it's animals that you can eat, but while they are young, while they are young. But overall, in general, you can castrate animals if there's a benefit in it for the person or a benefit in it for the for the for the animal. But otherwise, you should not. Because there are some ahadith, even though they prob they are weak, in Bazaar and Muslim of Imam Ahmad from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam naha an ikhsa al bahaim, an ikhsa al khail wal bahaim. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited castrating animals and horses. So they say this hadith is weak. This hadith is weak, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam slaughtered a castrated animal. And he would have not, the principle is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not do a makruh. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not do a makruh. So if there's an action that has a hint of prohibition or karaha to it, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did it, that would indicate the action is not makruh, but it would just be khilaf al awla It's a level less than makruh. It's better not to do, but not better not to do in practice in the sense that it would be much better. Makro would be much better not to do. This would be just appropriate not to do it. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not do a makro thing. He does not do a makro thing. Forget a haram thing. So he would not slaughter an animal that it's haram to do this action to it or makro to do this action to it. But some of the sahaba in the tafsir of the verse of the shaytan says, makes a promise to Allah that I will command them and then they would change the creation of Allah. Some of them have said, dawab. It's castrating animals, castrating animals. Therefore, when there's no reason to do it, no benefit to do it, 
and then you should not castrate the animal. You should not castrate the animal. But if there's a benefit for the human or benefit for the animal, you can do so. The same thing applies to castrating cats. The same thing applies to castrating cats. Some of the fuqaha mention it straight up, like the Hanafi fuqaha in Al-Fatawa al hindiya they mention that if there's a benefit for the human or benefit for the animal, the cat in castrating it, then you are allowed to castrate the, cat, the animal. The same thing with, the same thing if you were to cut, let's say you were to ask, can I cut the nails of the animal, of, of a cat, for example. The answer would be yes. The answer would be yes. But in saying all of this, a person should try and take the correct procedures not to harm the animal and not to cause unnecessary pain to the animal because that is prohibited. That is prohibited. So even the, I think the Shafi'i Fuqaha say as long as you're sure that that would not basically cause the animal to reach death as in castrating the animal. So when the Fuqaha speak on our last mas'ala, branding an animal. Can you brand an animal? The Fuqaha say it's not permissible, number one, to brand. It's haram to brand an animal in the face. It's haram to brand an animal in the face or cauterize an animal in the face. But if you cauterize it somewhere else, they say, number one, somewhere else. Number two, for a benefit, for a benefit. In doing so, then it's permissible. It's permissible. Basically, because sometimes to differentiate between the animals, you basically, you basically brand the animal. You brand the animal. So they say, for example, some of the fuqaha say, I think Imam Nawal rahmatullahi alayhi, he says to brand sheep in the ears. And he says for like cattle, to brand them towards the lower leg. He says because that's more muscle than meat. So there'll be less pain. And also there's less hair there. So it's easier to see the mark. It's easier to see the mark. That all of these things have to be done without already the prohibition in the face. Already the prohibition in the face. And all of these things have to be done without unnecessary pain to the animal. Unnecessary pain to the animal. Because Islam prohibits those things. Islam prohibits cruelty to animals. Rasulullah said in Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Hurairah anhu, that a man was walking and he was affected with severe thirst. He was affected with severe thirst and he walked by a well and he went down the well and he, dr and he drank some water and quenched his thirst. So when he came out, he saw a dog. He saw a dog basically with its tongue out, with its tongue out, out of thirst. Out of thirst, it was licking the moisture of the earth. It was trying to quench its thirst. It was panting with its tongue out in severe thirst and licking the ground, the moisture of the ground to basically quench its thirst. So the man said to himself, this animal is affected with what just affected me moments ago. So it went down, it went down the well. And then the man went down the well, took out his shoe, poured water in his shoe, collected water in his shoe, grabbed, pulled it, put it in his mouth. And then he used his hands to climb out of the well. And then he gave the animal water to drink from his shoe. Rasulullah said, فَشَكَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ فَغَفَرَ لَهُ فَشَكَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ فَغَفَرَ لَهُ Allah was thankful to this man to such an extent for forgiving, quenching the thirst of this dog. Allah was thankful. Allah is, Wallahu shakur. Allah is the most thankful. Yet, in takfuru فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌ عَنْكُمْ Allah is غَنِيٌ عَنْكُمْ Allah is not in need of you. Yet, Allah is thankful to certain deeds and to kindness. So the hadith is, فَشَكَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ Allah was thankful to him and Allah forgave him. And in another narration, فَشَكَرَ Another wording, فَشَكَرَ اللَّهَ لَهُ فَشَكَرَ اللَّهَ لَهُ فَغَفَرَ لَهُ That the dog thanked Allah for what this, uh, on behalf for what this man did. And therefore Allah forgave the man. So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, إِنَّ لَنَا فِي الْبَهَائِمِ أَجْرَى that do we get a reward for feeding even animals? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فِي كُلِّ كَبِدٍ رَطْبٍ أَجْرٌ فِي كُلِّ كَبِدٍ رَطْبٍ أَجْرٌ In every living creature, in every living soul that you feed, there's reward in it. In every living soul that you feed, there's a reward in it. Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi narrates from Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu anhu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered a garden from one of the one of the people of the Ansar. So when he entered the garden there was a camel there. So when the camel saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it started making a noise. It started kind of crying and wailing. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to the animal, went to the camel and put his hand behind the ear kind of patting it and massaging it. 
So when Rasulullah came there, the animal al-jamal. The animal calmed down. The animal calmed down. Then Rasulullah said, Who does this animal belong to? So a man from the Ansar said, Ya Rasulullah, the camel belongs to me. So Rasulullah said to him, أَفَلَا تَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِي هَذِهِ الْبَهِيمَةِ الَّتِي مَلَّكَكَ اللَّهُ إِيَّاهَا فَإِنَّهُ يَشْكُوا إِلَيَّ أَنَّكَ تُجِيعُهُ وَتُتْعِبُهُ But do you not fear Allah? Do you not fear Allah with regards to your treatment of this animal that Allah put you, put in your, put you the owner of? Because this animal is complaining to me that you hurt it and overwork it and tire it. That's how Islam teaches us to be with animals. That's how Rasulullah teaches us etiquette with animals. To the extent where Jabir anhu says Rasulullah passed by a, an animal that was branded in its face. So Rasulullah Jabir anhu says that Rasulullah said, May Allah curse the person who branded this animal in his face. Bukhari and Muslim Narrate from Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said دخلت النار امرأة في هرة A lady entered into Jahannam because of a cat that this lady caged and shackled and when she caged this animal she did not feed it or give it drink and this animal died as a result of that the animal died as a result of that and this lady was entered into was entered into Jahannam to the extent where Rasulullah didn't even say, now you must feed it or give it drink. He said, neither did this lady leave this animal to eat from the vermin of the earth or the insects of the earth. She shackled it completely. And the result of that, the punishment for that was very severe. Bukhari and Muslim, right from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, that Rasulullah said that there was a, a dog walking around the well and it had severe thirst. So a prostitute from the Bani Israel, a prostitute from the Bani Israel saw the dog in the situation and she felt pity for the dog. So she went down the well, filled her shoe as well with water, came out and gave this, water, this dog water, quenched this dog's thirst. So Allah forgave her for her sins, forgave her for her sins because she fed this. She just, all she did was give water to this helpless, thirsty dog. To the extent that Islam, Islam also, commands kindness and sympathy and goodness towards animals even when slaughtering them even at the time of slaughtering them Rasulullah وسلم, said inna Allah katib al ihsan ala kulli shay Allah said Allah has commanded that when you do anything try and do it in the best manner you can do it to such an extent when you kill kill in the best manner do not harm the thing that you are killing Kill it in a swift manner without harming it to the extent he said that make sure the weapon you are going to slaughter with is sharp. So there's no extra or there's no pain to the animal. It's a sharp cut and the animal doesn't suffer. And he said make sure when you rih the bihata, he said make sure the animal is calm and relaxed. Because otherwise the animal is kicking and un is, not, is restless and this will cause extra undue harm to the animal. So make sure it is in a calm rested manner. It's a calm and rested manner. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed by a man who had put the animal, the sheep, down to slaughter the other sheep. But then it, he took out his knife and he was sharpening his knife. And this animal is staring at this man, sharpening his knife in order to slaughter the animal. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, أَفَلَا قَبْلَ هَذَا أَتُرِيدُ أَن تُمِيتَهَا مَوْتَاتِ That couldn't you sharpen your knife before putting this animal down or out of the view of this animal? Do you want to cause this animal to die multiple deaths? Meaning the fear this animal will be in seeing you sharpen the knife that you're going to kill it with is already going to struck such fear into the animal that it might die before you insult it. To that extent Islam commands kindness to animals. Abu Dawood narrates from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu that he says we went out on an expedition on a journey with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went he went with his he went out to he went to answer the call of nature so he said we saw فَرَعَيْنَ حَمَّرَةً مَعَهَا فَرْخَانَ that there was a bird 
and this bird had two babies with with her this mother bird had two babies with her so we went and we just snatched the two ba the two baby birds so this animal that this bird was flying up and down restless and in panic where are my children and as she the, the bird the mother bird is doing that rasulullah comes and he sees this and he says <coughs> He said, who is the person causing distress and stress and restlessness to this mother animal? Return her babies to her as right now. So that is the kindness that Islam and Rasulullah teaches us to be with animals. So now even in slaughtering and anything we do with animals at home and treating animals, it should be done in the best manner. It should be done in the best manner and kindness to animals. This is what Islam sets down for us. And in the Western world, animal rights, things like that only came about in the 19th century in Europe. And that it was not even as precise and with so many details as Islam does. As Islam does. To the extent that Ibn Umar عنه, Muslim writes from Sa'id bin Jubayr عنه, that he says, I was walking with Ibn Umar عنه, and he saw a group of youngsters, they caught a chicken and they tied it up. And they were using this chicken as target practice for shooting. But when they saw Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, they ran away. So Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu says, I heard Rasulullah he says Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cursed people who do such a thing. That is Islam's guidance towards treating animals. And this is what we should remember with animals that we deal with, either in our house as pets or now in slaughtering. It's important to know the perfection of Islam and how Islam comes with so many details. And then we've covered most of the, uh, a lot of the Messiah connected to the defects of animals. Inshallah, in the upcoming lessons, we'll finish the remaining things of, of Udhiyah, connected to slaughtering next, then connected to the animal, specifying the animal, if something happens to the animal, and some rules to Udhiyah itself. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah ikhlas of al-qawli wal-amal. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal for sincerity in everything we say and everything we do. Muhusna al-khitam and antiha al-ajal. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give us a good ending when it's time for our death. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.